I can feel the excitement in the air. I love it. Um, hello and welcome to our May 360 presentation. I am Curator of Education Anna Smith, and today it is my honor to introduce artist Phyllida Barlow in conversation with Tyler Green. Now, if you made it down here today, I know you have navigated through Phyllida Barlow's incredible, towering, brilliant exhibition. We at the Nasher are not only honored to be exhibiting Barlow's work, but also excited to see our gallery spaces stretched, dwarfed, and reconfigured by her large-scale installations. I mean, what can I say? They look really good. <laughs> now, Barlow, after a distinguished career teaching at the Slade School of Art in London, is finally enjoying the broad international recognition her work has long deserved. In 2014, she executed a major commission in the Devine Galleries of the Tate Modern, and in the past five years has been the subject of exhibitions at institutions including the New Museum, the Henry Moore Institute, the Des Moines Art Center, and the Fruit Market Gallery. Her work was represented in the 55th Venice Biennale and the 2013 Carnegie International. And in 2011, Barlow was made a Royal Academician by the Royal Academy of Arts. Joining Barlow in conversation today is respected journalist and critic Tyler Green. After founding Modern Art Notes, the first and most prominent single author website about art, Green developed the Modern Art Notes podcast, which has become America's most listened to program about art. We are fortunate today to be part of a live recording for Green's podcast, which he will explain in further detail for you in just a moment. Before he does, though, I'll ask you to join me in a warm round of applause to welcome our guests, Phyllida Barlow and Tyler Green. This is going to be our second Modern Art Notes podcast with Phyllida. She was on um, when that was up at, at the Carnegie in Pittsburgh um, in 2013, and it was one of my favorite shows we've ever done. We've done 186 shows, and I'm not supposed to say one of them is my favorite, but. <laughs> um, and uh, so our conversation here is going to be um, uh, taped. It's, it's being taped. It'll be um, next week's show. It will air uh, on Thursday. Um, uh, you can subscribe to the Modern Art Notes podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, all those places if you, if you don't already. This week's guest is Catherine Opie. Next week is Philida. The week after that uh, is a non-artist. It's Nicholas Lemon talking about uh, Jacob Lawrence's migration series. Nicholas Lemon wrote the first uh, big book on, on the Great Migration. Um, and then the week after that, I think, is Nicole Eisenman, but don't hold me to that. Anyway, so, um, so uh, here we go. Phyllida Barlow, <laughs> welcome back to the Modern Art Notes Thank podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want, I'd like to start with um, uh, one of the wildly impressive experiences um, in, in, in Dallas and in art at the moment is kind of turning the corner from the sidewalk into the Nasher and being struck by this, by the monumentality of what you've done in that main middle bay. And so when you did your show um, at the Tate Britain um, dock, um, Adrian Searle, the British critic, wrote that um, what on a smaller scale can seem clunky becomes magnificently theatrical here. And turning from the sidewalk into the museum here, I think, has that, um, that same experience. Um, so is it easier for you to go big and dramatic like that or, or to work small? They're very different experiences. Um, working big involves the assistants who were here working with me during the last two weeks. So it has a collaborative element about it. And the actual production of the work is, is performative and theatrical, but what makes a huge difference, it's not that it's, it's not a competition of which is easier. It's more a different experience. But even with the bigger works, the sections never really get much bigger than my own dimensions. <laughs> it's only when they start to accumulate do they take on that kind of size. So I never think of myself as necessarily somebody who works big. <laughs> <laughs> the bigness is part of a, an adventure to explore space. It's almost a tool, a piece of equipment that enables me to reach up into the areas of the space that aren't usually <clears throat> occupied by art. And so to me, it's very much at that moment in the studio, my own curiosity. I always think of that quote from... 
mountaineers, and I can't even, I could hardly walk out the stairs without getting vertigo. So why <laughs> I would um, have this thing about mountaineers, I don't know, but, but it's that thing about being asked, why do they climb these mountains? And the answer is because it's there. And I think I have that same relationship with art spaces. You know, the spaces are there in all their manifest manifestations. There's high up, there's low down, there's width, there's going down. And especially here, the discoveries about this space I made whilst installing the work was absolutely phenomenal and endlessly surprising. And I hadn't completely appreciated that when I did the site visit. So for the people at home who haven't seen the piece yet, uh, two thirds of the show comes within six inches of the ceiling. Um, mm. Lots of pieces get, get all the way up there. Mm. Um, just to give um, a, a quick bit of, bit of background, um, you uh, kind of respond to site in, in, in when you plan an installation such as mm. this. Can you kind of walk us through how you engage with a building and think of putting together you know, five, six, ten pieces for a space the way you did here? Well, I think the show um, began to be made hard on the heels of making the Tate show. So there was a sort of run on about that way of exploring a very, very beautifully built art space. You know, the Tate Devine galleries are a series of different marbles and granites that um, rise up to this vaulted um, ceiling with a light um, going, running the whole length. So it's, it's, it's a fantastic space to take on sculpturally. And it was, in a way, this reciprocated it very much. Every surface is superb, you know. And the way the light does enter this building is extraordinary because the materials are natural materials and also the walls are real walls. They're not um, fabricated walls that divide up the space as one might see in many white cube spaces. So it's it, the argument of what to do is very much taking on the fabric of the space and the dimensions of the space. And the more difficult issue was the fact that there upstairs is two parallel spaces, which is actually quite uncomfortable for a way of how an audience might negotiate those spaces. So you're coming in and you're heading straight down one, and then you can take a right and you look right and left at the other. So it, it's quite controlling of how you experience a space, which actually is quite similar to to the Tate, but I wanted to try and disrupt that as much as possible by making the objects I use primarily take an audience, initially myself, I suppose, in how I related to the space, um, take me on that adventure of being able to look up, look through, look across, look backwards and forwards, and to then begin to think of a series of contrasting objects that would both welcome and then rebuff and then draw you on and then take you back again through all a series of different media, colors, forms that opened and shut or hung or made you look up and into and beyond. So the building was very much perhaps a kind of subject of the work initially. And definitely the narrative was to go, to be greeted by these, these balancing crates that would um, in some ways remain in a state of limbo. Then I, my idea in the studio was that they would be rather provisional. And as they were made under some kind of duress, they were made with rather a short window of making time that that urgency of making would still be retained within them. So the sort of naked underneaths of them would be left like that. 
and the way that they're sort of held together would be very exposed. In, in my view, the sort of half-made object or the remains of things that aren't necessarily completely finished, I have a fascination for that. And just, just to comment on that, it always seems to me extraordinary that our sort of um, lineage of Western art is very dependent on broken fragments of things for which we have no problem. You know, we look at torsos that don't have limbs, you know, that come from Hellenic times, you know, that are, what, six, 7,000 years old. Found in and the ground, they, found in water, wherever, yes, yeah. Yes, yeah, they're iconic. This is, this is great, you know, and Western art runs out of that, that greatness. And there doesn't seem to be an issue that the arms are missing and the legs are missing. You know, so the fragment and the half finished has, um, for me, as I think it does for everybody, a certain beauty, you know, it's sublime in some way. I'm not comparing my art to <laughs> <laughs> great Greek art. <laughs> well, before we're done with, with, with the building, so the, the national, I'm sorry, the Tate in, in, in London is a John Russell Pope and W.H. Romaine Walker building. This, of course, is, is a Renzo piano. Um, to mm. me, it seems like it would be kind of a jarring difference going from kind of those long, narrow, tall hallways um, in, in, a, in a neoclassical building to really different spaces here. Is it? No, that's what I, I found mm. fascinating, was that there was uh, reciprocity between the two. Um, but not the not difference... oppositionally, but in... Yes, yeah. in this, the, the, the length being quite problematic. Um, maybe sculpture can very easily become pictorial when there is mm. one entrance point and, yeah. and that's it. This, that certainly isn't the case here, but the length means that you're stacking things up against each other so that they start to obliterate each other. And therefore, it seemed to me important in the first instance to try and go high so that the, the act of looking up was very much part of the experience and then being able to see beyond the, first, the impact of the first objects. In the studio, it's very, very difficult to consider the audience, but the minute the work comes into the space, it, it does become theatrical and performative. The audience becomes the absolute key part of how the work begins to get put together and assembled. And that's when I hope the generosity begins. <laughs> I think there's a meanness of spirit in the studio where the making is so intense that it's a, a kind of selfish, self-obsessed activity at that point. But then it has to evolve into something very different. So there are two incredibly different stages. And to go back to your first question, the small works are completely different. They happen in a very private way. They happen quickly. They get abandoned. They get thrown away. They go through all kinds of cycles of making, which is just a relationship between me and those objects. You mentioned looking up and virtually, oh no, that's not right. You mentioned looking up and many of the pieces here mm. um, encourage us to look up. When you come in the entrance gallery, you look up into the crates. Mm. Um, mm. I, I don't want to give a piece away, but when you, when you get the stockade, which is the big kind of not quite square piece on the garden side in the second gallery, um, there is a point at which as you circumnavigate it, you are, uh, it is hinted to the potential viewer that the viewer should find a way to look up, mm. if you will. With, um, with Hanging Monument, the, the, the piece of the hanging kind of mm. pipe-like thing, um, you are encouraged to look up at the armature and to see mm. how that is. So when and why did the act of making the viewer look up become interesting or important? I think it's... Um always been there, either in a latent form, rarely a question 
that emerged very early on, which is, where does art end up? I know it doesn't seem to be answering your question. You know, do you, as in my case, enjoy it, or as I was doing in the 80s and 90s, just putting it on the roof of our then car, taking it somewhere and just putting it on a street corner <laughs> and, and abandoning <laughs> these things. And finally, after a few years of doing that, one night at three o'clock in the morning, I took them all to Blackfriars Bridge and chucked them in the Thames. <laughs> and <laughs> I, such is the way of artists, you know. <laughs> and um, it was one of the most liberating things I've done. <laughs> but I think that question of what is the destination for art? Is it someone's home? Is it a gallery? Is it a museum? Do you, as an artist who hasn't got collectors or galleries or museums, do you take that initiative yourself? Yes, of course you do. You go and find places. And maybe I began to think of, as I did when I was putting these, place, these objects around London in obscure places, I would sometimes put them high up, you know, above abandoned houses, doorways, or in strange nooks and crannies that were slightly out of reach. And it, it began to fascinate me, that idea that certainly a lot of the world is about looking up, looking into trees, looking at the sky, and why does art conform to this sort of eye-level tide line, if you know what I mean? No, I do. <laughs> and sculpture, of all things, seems to be able to invite the possibility both of defying gravity or using gravity as a material in its own right in trying to fight it, like the wonderful Ellsworth Kelly piece, which has the most amazing piece of fixing under the floorboard, so there's a sort of illusionistic um, apparatus going on there. I should, I should mention that uh, the permanent collection gallery um, here was uh, almost entirely selected by Phillida. <laughs> yeah. um, so a lot of, a lot of uh, my enjoyment then began to be about placing and almost like hiding, placing as a form of hiding. And where would that be? And um, when I went round London to collect the remains of the objects I dotted around, I think <laughs> I've got four or five. <laughs> they now inhabit a space on the top of a, a cupboard in my house, you know, and they've, they're thick with dust. And <laughs> such is my skill as a homemaker. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and I think this, this, the way we also, in, in terms of a, a domestic, you know, we place things all over the place and it goes unquestioned. It's what we do as human beings, you know, we, we store all those unart correspondence between the bread bin and the wall, or I do, I don't know, <laughs> you know, there are these clusters of um, extraordinary everyday life deposited in extraordinary corners, you know, and I think sculpture isn't just about inhabiting a comfortable space. It's a very awkward, difficult art form, and I think it, it can play with that. You know, another way a lot of the pieces here play with space is um, they encourage us to look through them. Yes. Um, to 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 um, to see what's in the middle mm. or um, on the other side, um, and and I, I, I want to talk about a couple of those those pieces mm. first. Maybe the the large boulder like pieces, which um, have hunks of wood and steel going through them, yes. and in a couple parts have these square portal-like openings with lots of gunk and goo in there, mm. and it's, yeah, they're fun to, to walk around and look into, mm. and there, you know, there, there is this temptation to stick your hand in there and see mm. what might happen, and um, <laughs> I mean, you know, are they alive? Uh, <laughs> and and so, I, you know, when I think of of sculpture that has holes in it, 
Yeah. Uh, yes. I think yes. of, of uh, two Brits, Hepworth and Moore. Absolutely. And yes. I think of an American, Jackie Windsor. Oh, yes. Um, mm -hmm. And I wonder if those, those holes or portals into those pieces, how much it has to do with each of those three. Absolutely. Totally. The hole in the sculpture, I think, is an extraordinary invention about making something very solid and obstructive have the other world on the other side visible and then going round and seeing the world that you've just been in revealed again. So it's, it's doing many things that argue with that physical state. It's in a way trying to defy it and puncture it. And I think it's an actual willful act on the part of artists to try and do that. Even painters, if uh, just looking at the, in the Rachowski collection yesterday, the fantastic Fontana there, the yellow Fontana with the bullet holes or whatever they are he used to shoot through, that, that I think artists do have a sort of destructive, violent side to them where the act of making isn't a caress always. It's actually quite brutal. Our acts of making are, you know, often as the noise this last two weeks has proved of the drills and the cutting of the steel and everything, it's the actions themselves are quite murderous, you know. But then they're also there are very gentle actions as well. But the whole in sculpture is, is I think, a combination of those. It's, it's a loving act to, in a way, enable something to breathe, to allow oxygen, air to flow through the whole thing. It's also the act of trying to escape, you know, burst through and explode out the other side. And I'm sort of absolutely intrigued by all those 20th century tropes, if you like, of trying to make sculpture have different forms of behavior in spite of the rigidity of the materials that were, were chosen. And you see that right across the, the board in, in many different ways. It's like the collapsed object, which in a way was one of the, the great things of Arte Povera, you know, or for instance, Robert Morris's felt pieces or his steam pieces, you know, things that usually have a, a way of not being fixed permanently, you know, so that being able to absorb that into sculpture in its actual state of feltness or steamness or um, string or all the extraordinary materials the Arte Povera artists use I think in a way were a kind of equivalent to the whole. It's dis disturbing or destabilizing the status quo of, of an object that might have a certain fixedness about it, mm. but refuses to be that. When, when we talked a couple years ago, um, you said that early in your career, um, you and kind of an entire generation of British sculptors were done with Henry Moore done with Barbara <laughs> Hepworth. I mean, it was, you know, it had been done. It was I'm embarrassed the end of about what I said about he and, Barbara Hepworth at that time. Well, but you, but you also <laughs> said that you, um, you know, a, a couple of years ago, we're, we're, we're kind of going back to them a little bit and oh, finding definitely. things. Yes, and and yes. I, yeah. I did not ask at the time and wish I had and can now. Mm -hmm. um, what in their work was it that you found useful to go back to? The invented form. I think at the time in the early 60s, the British obsession with landscape and craft and then the sort of hybrid marriage of those things becoming very figurative, as, as in the case of Henry Moore, was like a sort of stifling mantra, you know, mm. things that the bullying within sculpture departments of how you had to make and how you had to learn how to make. 
and in the Chelsea School of Art, there was a notice on the welding shop, no women allowed. And I, <laughs> I think, you know, in that background, someone somewhere along the line is going to get very, very angry indeed. <laughs> I was certainly that person. And I think uh, the, combined with the fact that all these things I was meant to learn, um, the welding, the woodwork, and I was just incredibly bad at. I just couldn't get to grips with it. So it became clay, and clay also performed in all sorts of quite amazing ways. It could be w almost like paint. You know, there was a, you could swipe it and whack it with wood. You could do all sorts of things with it. And then if you began to combine it with an armature that could be made in the most rough and expedient way, it completely <clears throat> overrid, overrode the um, craft, <coughs> sorry, the craft obsession, which I felt had sort of dominated, um, mm. British, I felt dominated British art. Mm. You know, the learning how to do something, and once you'd learned how to do it, you were ticked off, you would, you know, you got your tick and that was it. And I just felt there must be other ways of approaching this. And there were some teachers at that time who were absolutely um, on the same page mm. as that. So, but now looking back at it, I think especially with Barbara Hepworth was about to be a massive retrospective of her work. The, the, the sheer stunning invention of her forms are something that I think has left sculptural language in a way. It's been replaced by an obsession, an ongoing obsession with the ready-made, the found object and the appropriated object. And um, although I think, you know, that is clearly Duchamp's legacy and I have fantastic respect for Duchamp, I also think the way he's been academicized, you know, he's become, the intellectual high ground for certainly within art institutions. I think that's also combined with a kind of ignorance of knowing more about what he felt about making. If you read his essay, The Creative Act, it's just all about transformation of materials <laughs> and um, being able to change things, you know, transform things from one state into another state. And that I think he says, you know, what's the point of an idea? And I think that's absolutely fantastic because I think ideas, I'm not sure I've ever had an idea in my life, actually. <laughs> so <laughs> it's very, very reassuring to find that, you know, my arch enemy, Duchamp. <laughs> Felt the same. <laughs> yeah, it's hard for an artist to um, <laughs> survive into a fifth generation, which is, I guess, probably what we're approaching with kind of post Duchampian yes, sorts. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the um, other characteristics of a lot of the work here, mm. um, I mean, when, when you look at a, at a Henry Moore, you can tell it's heavy because mm. it's heavy. Um, but with a lot of uh, your work, here, but also in other of your work, it's impossible to tell whether it's heavy or not. Mm. Mm. And I, um, how intentional is that? Very. I mean, I love the. I think the bronze cast is the most magnificent piece of fakery. You know, the fact that it's what what the process is doing is taking a print off a surface, and then that printed surface is what a maximum. A centimeter thick, and inside is this void. Big void. And yet, it's claiming this huge solidity. And I think that act of deceit is is absolutely fantastic. And so, in a way, I'm playing with the same kinds of deceits. That sometimes things look like cement, but they're more likely to be paint. And they build up a tremendous weight, not necessarily through the inherent quality of the original material, which might be something like polystyrene, 
but they build that weight through what I add on to them in terms of the surface, which can be aspiring to look like um, other kinds of building materials like cement or stone or those kinds of very, very solid and heavy materials. So, so you don't want the work to look heavy or to look light. You want it to look like it could be either. Yes, I think I want that an ambiguity, but I'm very aware that there is a sort of act of fakery, um, which I see as theater in what that process is doing. I'm fascinated mm. by this, mm. these, these phrases, and those of you in the theater, and I know there's an expert somewhere here <laughs> who ran the Dallas Opera House. Some I can see him there. <laughs> I, um, that phrase, which is suspension of belief and suspension of disbelief, I don't quite understand what the difference is between those two statements. I know they are different, but I think sculpture employs the same kind of tactics of trying to make you believe in something that isn't actually true in the literal sense. You know, a bronze is hollow, it's not a solid thing, it's playing with being that, you right. know. I mean, stone is probably one of the most authentic materials there is in sculpture, and wood in the, in the way maybe Brancusi <coughs> used it. So speaking of theatricality, Mm. Um, I mentioned <coughs> Stockade earlier, which is actually called Untitled Stockade 2015, but mm. for the purposes of shorthand. Yes. Um, there is this incredible theatrical moment as you walk around the piece, and then as I mentioned earlier, you're encouraged to look up. Um, and there is this reveal. Mm -hmm. um, why, um, what about activating the interior of something physically, visually, whatever the word is, what about activating the interior appealed to you? Because it's playing with that state of ambiguity and making it very, very clear that everything that is seen is actually incredibly simply built. There is no there is no trickery. What, what you see is what you get at that moment when you go through the back and look in. And there's a fascination from my point of view of a sort of front of house display and then a, a sort of front stage display and a backstage yeah. acknowledgement. And backstage, it's all pulleys and weights and gantries and everything that's supporting this moment of pretense at the front that's got to be believed. And I think sculpturally, that for me becomes intriguing. So being able to see the interior and just see that it's got a very similar structure holding it all in place as the boxes, the crates in the other gallery, um, makes it, in a way, have its own dramatic content. You know, the front is all drama and show, and the back becomes, in a way, much more um, self-aware, in some ways, of its own physicality. And the fact that it's actually cantilevered, it's, it's balanced, then makes all those struts and cross braces absolutely essential to how it's perched on that um, slalom of black pallets. It's in a way an object on a base, on a plinth, which is another sort of sculptural trope. It's just a very re-manipulated one. In, in that sense, I think the way I work and the way I think sculpturally is incredibly traditional. You know, it's about taking a lot of those um, very, very ancient sculptural concerns, but reconfiguring them so they're heavily disguised and in a way become something else. 
So you've been playing with this um, house-ish form for mm. four or five years now. Um, and it seems mm -hmm. to me that every time you make one of these pieces, mm -hmm. you show us a little bit more of the inside. That mm -hmm. there's been a progression of, you know, you couldn't quite see in it, or you couldn't see much that was in it. Um, in mm -hmm. the piece at the Carnegie, um, you kind of recoiled in horror when I told you I was jumping up to try to look over the top, <laughs> and you pointed out to me I was being stupid because I could have just looked from the bottom. Um, <laughs> are you are you conscious of letting people, or is that intentional? Letting people see more each time. Mm, is that I, I think it'd be wonderful if people were able to enter sculpture galleries crawling on all fours so that they had an entirely different view of everything. I know that's not very You could do it friendly. next. <laughs> you could do that now. I certainly couldn't do it because I've got <laughs> false knees. But I, I, I think the eye level thing is, is a kind of problem with sculpture, you know. And I think that, you know, certainly in a city like Rome, you've got sculpture high, low, you know, all over the place, and it's, it's, it's fantastic, you know. It only seems to be in a 20th century kind of convention, in a way, that sculpture should be an eye-level art form, you know. But actually, historically, it's, it's never been that, you know. And I think that, you know, the idea of crouching to see something or just going lower down to see what it is. And that, that was a real discovery here because of the staircases taking you up into the galleries. That is an and, awesome thing here, yeah. Yeah, really uh, remarkable to be in a gallery where that is possible, that, that sculpture can be seen from way below and then you come into it. It's, it was a tremendous um, feeling that when we were setting up the pieces, you know. We've been talking about, I guess, every piece we've talked about, really, in terms of form and space. We haven't talked about color at all. Mm. Um, stockade's probably a good place to start with that. Mm. So the outside of the piece um, is a very recognizable Barlowian palette, um, one that's been in your work for a number of years now. Um, what is the relationship between the color, or is there one, between the colors you use inside stockade on the two by fours Mm. inside stockade and the colors we see on the outside? I think it's just a sort of aesthetic playfulness is to drag the color inside just as mm. a trace. Um, I don't think there's much more to say than that. It's almost in a way like a painting where maybe the neutral color of the canvas, if it is neutral, isn't doing quite enough. And so I Took the tim we took the timbers out and we just washed them with, with um, paint. But actually, a lot of those, I have to remember, come from another work. And so they were already painted. And a lot of the wood in the studio gets um, painted by default. You know, <laughs> It's used for other works to rest on, and then it gradually accretes. <laughs> so do you keep track of... of um, either in a formal way or in an informal way, what you're reusing from what exhibitions and installations? Mm. All the black palettes under the uh, house come from the Tate. They're the Tate chopped up. And then the... <laughs> um, yeah, they're, they're, they're those colored things there. Yeah, web images are... of them on manpodcast.com. Um, they um, have become some of the, the lengths of wood inside the stockade piece. So, is so that things are constantly... I mean, none of the Tate work exists anymore. It only exists in my studio in great stacks of timber and things like that. So um, it's, an, it's an incredible resource for future works. Is and the physical relationship to the previous work conceptually important to you, or is it just part of the practice and part of the way it's, it's an evolutionary thing. It's, oh, oh that I did that there. I now want to try it. Here. Here, yes, and I want to try it again in a different way. Yes. Mm. There are, um, uh, as, as one goes through this show or, or any 
Philip Barla show, the, um, the, the title cards list the materials of, of the pieces, and they're, they're pretty good reading in and of themselves because there's kind of a lot in everything. Um, and I'm curious about how you get to some of your materials and why they interest you. So for, for Fallen Tires, which is mm. um, uh, the piece with kind of the grayish painted meshy round forms. Mm. Um, the heap of stuff. Yeah, the right. heap yeah. of stuff. Um, <laughs> uh, you said it, not me. Uh, <laughs> so I thought maybe that meshy painted the, material would be a good place to mm. maybe ask you to explain what about that material interests you. Well, the, all materials I use are materials that I can change because my process of making is very restless. It doesn't... I don't necessarily find a result immediately. So the materials enable me to cut into them or remove them or make new decisions. The meshy material is as old as the hills. The Egyptians were using it. It's called um, scrim. And you, it comes in big rolls. You cut off a length of it and you can soak it in a material like cement or plaster, and then it sets hard and it adds extra strength to the plaster and the cement. So it's a very expedient material to use for a modeling process. So its appeal is its, was its expediency rather than? Initially, it's its expediency, mm. and then I try to exploit it aesthetically as well in the sense that Usually what happens with scrim, certainly if you look at a Henry Moore, which are built in that way, the scrim is kind of obliterated. And I remember him saying, you know, you don't want to show any of that material because it, it shows how the things are made. And I never quite understood the logic of that, you know. <laughs> so, um, in his works, you will never see the scrim, although in the original plasters there, it's there, you know, as it is in a lot of sculptors' work who use those materials. Another material I wanted to ask you about was uh, the fabric yeah. that you use mm. in the downstairs piece at the Nasher. It's kind of a forest of uh, where, where, the, where the fabric is the branches of, mm. and, and, and foliage of the trees, and, and two by fours make up, make up the trunks. Mm. Um, uh, so you've played with fabric before, so in a, mm -hmm. in a piece at the Des Moines Arts Center four years ago, three years ago, um, um, something like that. You draped it over two forms, years. two years mm. ago. You draped the fabric over forms, mm. and here the fabric is supported by, by, these, by these two by fours. Mm. Um, uh, what, what, was, what, what, for you, what was the difference between draping and, and flag-like supporting? I think it's a formal one that the... I started using these banners um, about 10 years ago, maybe longer ago, as a kind of prop almost that would intervene in the, in the space with a mm. flat blast of colour that acted almost gesturally, almost like a gestural yeah. um, piece Big of colour. In fact, yeah. in the... Um, Dallas show I did at UTD, there was a huge orange banner in that show, so it's longer than 10 years that I've been using them. And they, they also have a sort of... For me, they don't really connect with nature. They collect, connect with human behaviour. They're both, you know, the, the object that we see on the streets maybe for protest or demonstration. They're also the object that I can be identified with festivity. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I yeah. think the blank, the blank banner, which is neither one thing or the other, um, fascinates me. It's like something that has its own inherent about to be something. And to me, the banner is also something that can be moved. You know, so there's the potential for the crowd of banners to almost take up arms and start <laughs> <laughs> to move up the stairs. marching. Yes, yeah, <laughs> and uh, yet as a static 
object, it becomes, for me, very painterly and pictorial, especially as you come down the stairs. So colour is both a kind of gestural intervention in a, in a space, but also takes up a kind of formal residence there or habitation there of cutting through, occupying, and has, has a potential, in the case of the banners, to a potential for movement. Um, the, the ones over the awnings um, was in a way rather, rather similar, but I wanted to make the shape not an upright thing, but a thing coming into the space across the space, and that's why um, they're draped in that way. So I wanted a very solid architectural form that was actually based on the kind of awnings that um, you can see in over shop windows or all sorts of places like over doorways, but then kind of counteract that architectural form with something that was very unusual to that, which was draping them with the, mm. with the colored fabric. When you have as much fabric as you have in a, a hard museum space, mm. um, one of the things that happens is it soaks up sound. So mm. as you go through the piece yes. here, so is that intentional or is that a no, nice no, byproduct? No, that, no, that's not intentional, but it's, it was something I noticed straight away. You know, I have a very odd, relationship with all these fallouts from making work that it inevitably happens because I have absolutely no control over how things will get used or experienced. But um, to me, sculpture is a silent, still art form. And we are the things that agitate it. We walk around it. We walk through it or against it, you know, but the thing itself is still and silent. And that's what I personally love about it. But the fact that the banners have offered another sentient experience, you know, is it wasn't in my, wasn't on the script for them at all, mm. you know, um, but it's interesting that they yeah. do do that, yeah. Um. So one of the things that Asher asked you to do was to pick some works from the permanent collection mm. that, that you wanted up while your stuff was up. Mm. Um, and if somebody had told me you were going to pick three Joel Shapiros, you could have knocked me over with a feather. I never <laughs> in a million years would have seen that coming. Um, so we'll have images of all three of the Shapiros you picked um, on, on manpodcast.com. Um, but could you, um, has he been, important to you for a long time? Why did you pick those three? Well, I picked the blue crate because obviously it's, that's how I should have done them. <laughs> <laughs> the, the blue crate uh, in the Nasher collection has three legs yes. and <laughs> fill it as upturned crates have seven or eight. Yes, I know. So he, he, it just was the most wonderful sort of serendipitous experience to see that work in the collection. So it had to go in. And then I've always loved his um, sort of split, semi-collapsed, or things that are caught in a very uncomfortable moment formally. They look as if they're about to do the splits or mm -hmm. um, fall over. And I think that plays with the sculptural language so brilliantly, you know, that sculpture isn't a table, it's not a chair. They, those things can be used, and I have used them up there. But they, they want to take those kinds of the, the familiar and take it by surprise and change it and make it do and behave in ways that things don't usually behave. And I think he, he does it with his work very, very successfully. And it's hard to figure out how heavy those pieces are. Mm, exactly. I mean, there is yes, that weightlessness we were talking yeah, about before. Yeah. Or quite how it does I still stand that in out. that I way. I have no yes, idea how this yes, thing stands. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, a couple other art, art history references mm. in, in the pieces. Um, 
So in, in one of the uh, kind of boulder type forms mm. inside mm. here, there is um, a wooden and foam lined uh, horseshoe like shape mm -hmm. sticking out. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it feels like a pretty direct Richard Deacon quotation. <laughs> um, it wasn't, it isn't meant to be. If it is, I, you know, I, I love Richard Deacon's work. Some of it, so that would be a great honor. But it it was it's actually based on some. I've been making those boulder like shapes for some time and adding various prosthetic yes. interventions into them, and um, it's it's really they're really about giving the object a, a direction. It's almost like sticking a tongue out for me, rather than a horseshoe. Um, I know we're in Texas. Oh, that's and so <laughs> <laughs> I've forgotten who it was who said to me, "Thank you for the reference to Texas with the horseshoe <laughs> shape." <laughs> and uh, I hadn't actually thought. I, I thought of it as a sort of a kind of gesture that was pointing outwards or taking taking the object away from its position there and making it look into another direction. Uh, so that's what the aim of those ones, those added pieces were. Um, yes. How much do those boulder type shapes have to do with Franz Vest? Um, probably an enormous amount. <laughs> Uh, his early work is some of my absolute favorite work. And, but I think the West, the Franz West influence is actually more in the horse, again, horseshoe shape, the, the curved plaster piece in the first room, which you can enter. I mean, I'm thinking of Franz West's earlier works, which you actually stepped mm. into. Or I'm, picked up. Or, yes, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah. So, oh, that's interesting. I would mm. I, I would not have guessed that because mm. um, well but could you maybe talk us through how you ha um, uh, I mean so Franz Vest and yours I mean he's he's no longer with us of course mm. but your careers do more or less line up mm. overlap um, mm. do you remember when you became aware of his work uh, and, and then and then when you think his work began to inform yours oh I mean the minute I saw it I felt. Oh, right this away. is this is a fantastic way of making the object have a very specific relationship with the viewer, you and know, the viewer's and viewer's body. Yeah. Yes, and a, a quite a controlled relationship. I don't think I've ever done that, but I think with the objects that went on televisions and on chairs, in some ways, were referencing that in an obtuse kind of way, you know. But I think especially the fact that he used plaster and he used it in this very quick, expedient way. Enough was enough was also a great influence, you know. And, um, but I think to then make a plaster object be something that you could enter and use and handle uh, was also, I don't know, it just was like taking something that's usually used as quite a architectural static kind of material and make it become very bodily was very attractive. So those early Franz Vest pieces um, that uh, viewers, uh, which is a word which only sort of fits, um, were meant mm. to pick up and handle were called adaptives. Mm. And they had these plaster forms on one end and then kind of a black stick coming out of them. So you mm. can pick them up and swing mm. them and you know use it like a baseball bat or a golf club or whatever. Mm. Uh, and now that you mention it, it does kind of seem like with um, Untitled Holder, the U-shaped piece, mm. that there is a little bit of a temptation to you know, take a brick out of the wall. And mm. Mm. Was that <laughs> intentional, that you want people to feel like, I I'm not, I'm not suggesting they do it, but. I definitely wanted it to be a work that would draw you into the space. And in fact, my first choice of citing it went very awry. It just killed it 
stone dead. And then we, thanks to Jed. <laughs> Jed Morris, curator here Jed, at the Nasher. Yes, yes. Um, we tried four different locations for it. So we had to put it up and down four times and eventually freed it of all its kind of rather strict regulations I had imposed on it and just left it in the middle of the space where it, I think it, it's allowed to do its own thing very well. But I think this issue of touch is, for me, problematic. I, I think touch is a language. It's a non-verbal language. And how you imagine touching something seems to me to be more important than actually reaching out and touching it, where the minute you've touched it, the, the mystery or the imaginative process gets solved. You know, that's closure on it. And I think there are, we talked about it yesterday, there are numerous art objects where there is a longing to touch or a longing to be interested in what this thing is. But I think that is up to us to work out. It's what we then want to imagine this might be. Is it hot or cold? And there are artists who now um, very much play with that, like Pierre Huyg made the um, uh, figurative sculpture that is actually hot when you touch it. <laughs> I, I think that's a, a sort of fascinating game. I, I found that work, for me, very, you know, the minute you'd done that action, I didn't quite know what else there was to discover about it. I think it was more interesting in, in a sense where you became very aware that it was heated up. But to actually touch it meant that something ended, you know, you'd solved it. And I think I have personally a problem with art where there is that final answer. There is a one-line answer to the experience that you're engaging with. So to me, touch is one of the great, great sort of mysteries of how we interpret the, the, the surface that's in front of us, what it might be, whether it's hot, cold, smooth or rough. It just seems a very beautiful experience to be engaging with. I prefer people not to touch my work. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> and certainly not to remove a brick from it because I'm <laughs> concerned about their, their safety more than I am oh, about yeah. the object. <laughs> I've, I've read you uh, talk about that tension that the potential of tactility creates mm. Um, mm. in the past. Uh, is that something that you came to through working in your studio on a daily basis, or is this something that goes back to when you were a teenager and touched something at the Tate you shouldn't have? Um, I think it came very much from first beginning to work with clay, that oh. you could work clay forever and ever and it would just die. And then, you, you know, barely touching it, if you were confident enough, you could get exactly the right moment. Um, caught there just through the minimal minimal amount of touching. And so there were, there were all these different ways of touching. And I was always interested in the issue about Eva Hess, who seems to be somebody who's considered to be a very tactile artist. But it's interesting that a lot of her work was hardly touched at all because of the materials being so lethal. Yeah. I think she used very particular wooden tongs to dip the muslin into the resin, etc. You know, and yet you think of a, um, an artist like uh, McCracken with these highly, po his early work, which were also resin, yeah. which look untouched, but every inch of them is, you know, sanded and sanded and sanded until it reaches that high specification, that high shiny um, look about it. So there's a sort of weird paradox about what might be considered a cool object like a John McCracken and a hot object like Eva Hess, where they're actually, the processes are very reversed. 
And I think that was a kind of epiphany early on with the handling of materials, you know. Does that have mm. something to do with, so the upturned crates, which mm. come up close to the gallery uh, ceiling, mm. um, are some of the most at least visually tactile pieces in the show. Mm. Is that part of why they ended up up there? Yes, I think so. There's a sort of, I, I think the longing to do is a really powerful human instinct. And uh, I think encouraging or, for me, allowing that to be a very emotional and thoughtful process and a very difficult thing to articulate verbally as I think a lot of the senses are you know it it's it's a need to explore that with materials to allow the materials to maybe engender that those desires and hopefully make them become very positive experience about how and why you would want to mm. touch. Um, I mean, I think for me, you know, this sounds so fanciful and sentimental, you know, touching a dog or stroking a dog, I desperately miss my dog who died whenever it was, two or three years ago now, but I still miss that wonderful, that head that's there, you know, and always there. And um, it's, I think there are those very daily, very moving experiences that we go through, whether it's, you know, embracing our children or our loved ones. They're all highly powerful and wonderful experiences. And for me, sculpture can, can offer that as, not as a sort of literal experience where you've got to carry it out, but you, you can be reminded of those uh, qualities that we have, as well as the opposite, that maybe there are things that are quite repellent as well. I think they operate in tandem, and I think they're part of a very powerful repertoire of sensations that sculpture can explore. Mm. You know. We're going to open, up, open it up for questions in just a moment, but, um, but before we do one last Question, um, you did an interview a couple years ago, or a conversation, I should say, with Vincent Fecto in, in Bomb Magazine. Oh, yes, yes. And one of the things that the two of you, I think it was the two of you, discussed mm -hmm. was um, uh, what artists, and in this case sculptors, of course, it, you know, what is the last thing they do in making yes, a piece, yes, and then yes. why it was the last thing. Mm. They, mm. they do in making a piece. So what was the last thing you did here, and why was it? the end, the finish? Um, what was the last thing? Golly. It was all so on the go. Um, I'm... The last uh, sort of proper physical thing was actually binding the cemented um, canvas round the hanging monument. Oh. Um, but I worked on it with three people. Do you mean in terms of a physical yeah, action? Yeah. Yes, that was the last thing. So why was, that, why was that the last? Well, I'll tell you what, we made, I made one. I made one earlier, as they do in the cooking programs. <laughs> 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 and there was a, a bit of a crisis with transport. <laughs> it was too big for the steel containers to mm. come across the sea. So within oh five days flat, we knocked up another one. So I and three, three assistants um, made the one that's there now that does fit into the container. And so that was the last thing. And the last actual gestures were the yeah. binding of the the, with the strips of torn canvas. The canvas came from the Tate as well. It was ripped up into strips, dipped into cement and wrapped round as if it was like spools of some material. And then in order to hold that all in place, I then dipped long strips of um, 
scrim into cement and then added that on. But that's an interesting... Really? Yeah, uh, then we adjusted the weight of it, mm. and we had to adjust the weight of it again here. But that's an interesting case in point because I didn't quite know when that one was finished. And I kept on going and going, and then it was... Rupert and Adam, who are well, the assistants here, who said, look, you've got to stop, or it's gonna, the next crisis we're going to have, it's just <laughs> going to be too heavy to go into the It, it is museum. impossible to figure how heavy that, 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 that It's a little bit is. heavy. <laughs> is, is, is its weight, so, so the, the you know, thing the, that holds it up, Yes, um, the, um, it has all hmm. these kind of steel beams. Yes, the, all of that is absolutely essential to supporting it. None of that, although we were trying to m make it look um, shambolic in some way. It looks uh, compositional. Yeah, compositional, that's a better way. But it's also <laughs> utilitarian then. Yes, absolutely, yes. Because when I was so, trying to solve the Joel Shapiro mystery, that was my first guess, mm, is that mm. there was some Joel Shapiro in that. Mm stuff in all that yes. steel but no. on the back of that steel structure are a load of boxes filled with sand that then adds yeah. a extra ballast to making sure it just doesn't <laughs> keel over so it's um a real kind of double security job on that one but in terms of the wrapping Hmm. You, you know, there's a, there was a side of me that just could have gone on and on and on doing it. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I think that thing of where something stops. I mean, how do we know what the last mark is on a Jackson Pollock or almost any um, painting? You know, it's quite interesting the point where an artist steps back and says, enough. You know, and maybe there are a lot of works where it actually isn't enough. You know, the... Even a Cezanne, you know, you painters can have been known to go back to painting. <laughs> <laughs> Let's open it up. Who has? Uh, yes, right here. Conversely, uh, my last question that you asked: uh, Where did you begin? Why? And how long did the whole installation project take? So the question was: uh, Where did you begin? Why? And how long did the whole installation take? The the work the first works I began to do were these crates that are in this first gallery as you come in. And they were designed in a way to come apart for transport. So each crate consists of five sides. And um, I began there because I had the clearest idea that I wanted to reach the ceiling of the Nasher. And then I was hoping that having initiated that, I would get some sense of what would bounce off formally in a way from having made that work. I hope that answers your question. Part one, and the other part, how long did the entire installation take? What, well, working here in the Nasher, two weeks. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for being here. This is fascinating. I caught the ironing board as your face and the sculptures that's going around in the slides as you look. And then I see the cantilevers with cloths open them, and then more cantilevers with cloths open them. And I'm wondering if there's something in the ironing board a vision that particularly appealed to you. Did the iron work come first or the cantilevers come first? Mm -hmm. Was it right? The, um, no, no, it's a, it's a wonderful question. The ironing board, I love the ironing board as a structure and the fact that the way it's, I mean, I, I find the iron and the ironing board completely incompatible things. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think ironing a shirt is one of the most... I want somebody to teach me how to iron. You get to the end of it, and you've got to begin all over again because the, the, the cord of the iron has tangled itself. Do, do you want to hear this? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I... <laughs> I, I just find it absolutely impossible. So there's a kind of hatred of... 
that, of what it <laughs> symbolizes, but a love of it as an object in the sense that it's such a simple structure to put up. And then, and then the idea of just using it and making it redundant with the object on top of it fascinates me. I don't think I've answered your question at all, but I think there is a simple structural form in an ironing board that is inherent to how one might build almost anything. It's another plinth. Yes, yes, yeah, exactly. But also the, the, the crossover structure is such a sort of basic structure in everything, whether it's scaffolding for a building or inside probably the walls of this mm -hmm. building somewhere, or in building when you look at the... Um, you know, you look at almost any bridge, its structure has that kind of um, crisscross structure within it. Uh, but I, I think I probably didn't quite hear what you were saying about the cantilevered thing. I <laughs> reckon. Uh, yes. Yes, uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, could you answer briefly and tell me uh, the process you go about to naming your exhibitions? I notice that a lot of them are five letters in length. And could you speak a little bit why the exhibition is named interest? Yes. Um, I, the way I began to work on the objects, it was almost as though one object was inviting the next object. And it became like a, a sort of dialogue between creatures or things that didn't actually know each other. And I think a tryst is about a secret liaison, it's about meeting under cover of darkness or in a, in a way that is not to be, is, doesn't have a sort of public uh, face to it. And I, I saw this very much as that because these objects hadn't actually had the opportunity to come together in the studio. So this was the first time they were going to meet each other, if you like. And, and so it was very like a tryst between them, uh, if that. So the, the, the five letter long exhibition titles, is that? Yeah. Well, I like um, words that are both verbs and nouns. So in, in the, original exhibition at Hauser and Worth in Piccadilly in London. It was called Rig, so sort of rigging something up, or a rig. They're both, um, one is a verb and one is a noun. And I quite, because of the sheer labor and activity of making sculpture, I quite, I wanted to use something that had that sense that a verb has of being action but also the object of being a noun as well. <laughs> if that doesn't sound too pretentious, it does sound. <laughs> um, in the back. Uh, given the nature of the, all the different materials you work in and the uh, perhaps temporary, uh, I guess, uh, placement of them, is the craft execution and craftsmanship all you want it to be? Involved in one. Is the craft and execution uh, in the pieces all you want to do? It is it at the level that you would, if you were building for permanence in, in some cases, uh, would you attain a different, uh, shoot for a different level of precision in the work? Um, I, I have a love of the improvised and spontaneous action and the sense of playing with the chance that something might not be quite right and then being able to maybe go on with that and seeing where that mistake leads. So I think there is a high level of craft in, in one way with the work, but it's under cover of something that might appear quite casual or informal. And I think that's, in a way, the language that I'm exploring. Um, so I can't say with any confidence that everything is absolutely perfect. 
I think there's, there's probably flaws in, in the work, but I, I'm confident that I'm exploring a language that I'm interested in, which is the language of the, something that's abandoned, broken, um, about to be mended, repaired. The whole, the whole language of human endeavor, which is a very daily, a daily exploit that we're all involved in, you know, whether it's just cooking and then washing up and restacking the dishes, etc. There's, there's constant cycles of activities that we're very familiar with that are about something being in one state and then being changed to another state. And I think that's what I'm, that's what I'm, I've been exploring sculpturally for many years. Uh, I mean, maybe I can ask you the question, do you find the craft element, <laughs> do you find the craft element very lacking? Is it, I mean, please, please be very honest because I'm. I, I see what you're getting at when it comes to the broad uh, colors and surfaces, for example, the fabric there. I think the exposure of rough hewn palette level <clears throat> timber <clears throat> supporting it all is where I find the disjunct. I understand what you're trying to achieve with the surfaces that our eyes are drawn to, again, the broad colors and shapes. Mm. But when you look underneath and there's randomly hammered together pieces of scrap wood, is that where my question is, is that what she's really trying to achieve or? Does it, does it, I mean, does it distress you? Do you find it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Absolutely, it's not clean. Polished surfaces, etc. You know, but no, there is a, there is a, there is a disjunct there, a disjoint to me that uh, mm. makes me makes me question or ask, compelled me to ask you that. I think it's very, on my part, it's contrariness. It's very intended um, because I, I enjoy the way we have to solve things in an emergency. You know how we fix something that's been blown down or how we mend in a provisional kind of way a broken thing. Uh, I just, I, I find it fascinating where human, human endeavor is tested somewhat. And I think I'm in a way trying to capture that. It, it's, I think it's a symptom of being alive. You know? <laughs> no, it, it, I, it does seem interesting to me that there is this language of flaw around sculpture yes. yeah, when yeah, there yeah. is not a language of flaw around painting. Mm. No one ever talks, and they sure could, about how there are parts of a painting that, yeah, <laughs> you know, there's a mistake there, there's a flaw there. But we do talk that way about sculpture. I don't know why. Well, I think what, what I think it's, I would love to write about this because I think sculpture, you've got 360 degrees in, uh, to experience it in. Yes, that's I think as a, working in that way, I think you're pretty lucky if you get half of those right, whatever that is. It's around 180 and then, degrees. I mean, even <laughs> if you think, I don't know, do you all know Rodin's Kiss? There's a wonderful, there's an, an artist who took photographs of Rodin's Kiss where you wouldn't recognize that it was Rodin's Kiss because we're so used to, to the iconic view of it. And then you look at these other views and it looks extremely odd and extremely uncomfortable as an object. And in a way, I'm sure he enjoyed that because a lot of his work is exploring that uncomfortable moment where the figure is caught off guard. But I think mm -hmm. it, it demonstrates something about the fact that you have to keep moving with sculpture <laughs> and, and discover those flaws and sort of make them operate in terms of the whole. I'm probably um, taking it almost as an aesthetic indulgence in a way to explore that, that flaw and make it be very much part of the experience. A conscious decision not to labor over every bit like Absolutely. Henry Moore did. Yeah. But uh, yeah. One, one or two more? Yeah. Mm. Uh, <laughs> 
Sorry. Uh, Hi. Hi. Can, can you talk a little bit about, uh, I mean, watching, I mean, coming in here and performing these installations and doing the take and here in Carnegie and all of those, uh, you know, enormous, you know, gestures of, you know, performing these works. Uh, and then watching them all come down and become, you know, reclaimed in a different way and reconstructed. But if you see yourself, uh, I mean, is there a yearning to go and do an installation that could be a permanent, large scale installation that will then represent your work in a way that, you know, maybe mm -hmm. in, you know, perpetuity, some sense of a Marfa kind of, you know, I, yeah. That, uh, but, to, but to be able to do an installation that stays and remains in, you know, with that kind of. I'm getting there. I'm, I'm thinking about it, but <clears throat> I think it's um, the whole debate of what con constitutes a public work is one that I haven't really embraced you know i haven't embraced it as either a physical process or as a mental process and i need to you know i think it would be it's a challenge i need to look at i mean my favorite public works are quite quite obscure in how they present themselves visually i've i've quoted the walter de maria um, kilometer right. rod, which I think uh, now is in sections in the deer, but I mean that originally was just a brass, the top of the kilometer rod in the pavement, and I I just think it's the most fantastic public art space work, and I think Hans Harker, the piece he did for Munster, is also wonderful. So there are these incredible works, but I think they step out of line with the usual expectation of a work in a public space. But I think I'm beginning to be ready for that challenge, but I'm intimidated it by one, the fact that it's, it's got to have a certain level of performance, which is 365 for, you know, the whole time, 24 hours a day, and there isn't any um, kind of boundary to that experience. I find that intimidating in some way. Not, not the fact that the public are there or would use it or abuse it, that intrigues me actually. It's more that it's meant to be a kind of bling moment. I find that sort of horrific in a way. <laughs> Last one over here because it had better be. <laughs> Oh, yes, sorry. <laughs> when I saw the fabric piece, just reminding me of the Gates exhibit in Central Park 10 years ago. Yes, I know, yes, and yes. It's like a free and bright color, impermanent, and, uh, mm. you know, short lived, maybe two or three mm. weeks exhibit. Mm. And uh, the other gentleman's question did you see that exhibit, or what do you think about that Gates? The question was, is about the gates uh, by Christo in New York yes, and whether yeah. there's a... I read the Hal Foster uh, review on it. That's it was an absolutely brilliant review of it and um, was fascinating. I didn't see it, but of course I was intrigued because as somebody who also uses that form, I was very intrigued by actually releasing it out into the into a public space like that. I think because I was already using that form, I didn't feel, I felt it was a shared, a shared formal object that he was using and I was using. So it didn't sort of obsess me that, oh my God, I can never use this shape again. I just felt it was in a very different way. I mean, I think, I, I don't think, banging your head to be new and to be innovative just for the sake of it is is necessary for an artist we're always going to overlap you know every 
everything in my show has precedents that are, have gone well before me. But I think one has to ride that wave, if you know what I mean. I don't know whether um, the Christo piece is, is more exciting or less exciting than mine. I, in a way, I don't care. I'm just intrigued that maybe he was making the banner take to the streets in, in the way that I'm giving these the role of actually being in waiting. We don't know whether they, I don't know whether they will take to the streets, whether they're celebratory or they're protesting about something. And that ambiguity is more where I'm leaving them, if that answers your question. Yeah, I also like if you had a gentleman's question, like, you know, some objects is prominent and yours, some of them are not prominent. And after things you see, it's gone like that. Life is so impermanent, and so I feel kind of understand. Well, I, I think a lot of this work here probably will be taken away and stored somewhere in the dreaded, a dreaded art warehouse in <laughs> <laughs> wooden boxes, you know. <laughs> and I have a huge problem with this aspect of our contemporary art scene, you know, that so much art is incarcerated in crates somewhere. <laughs> and it, it does seem to be another issue about where is the destination for art, you know. Um, so it's a great question. But I, yes, I mean, I have a love of the impermanent, but I don't think this work here is particularly impermanent. Yeah. <laughs> Phil and Barlow, thanks so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.